Great, we'll go ahead and get started here. Again, thank you everyone for uh, attending today's session on funding virtual care in a time of crisis. Obviously a very relevant and timely uh, manner to be talking about here at today's audience and excited to share some lessons learned and insights from you on, on uh, what we have to do thus far. Uh, just a quick overview of what we'll cover today uh, in today's 30 minute session. Uh, really unpacking the FCC COVID-19 telehealth program, you know, what it means, who it's for and who's eligible. Um, we'll also uh, overview of additional funding opportunities that are coming out, um, some even as, as recent as today for uh, healthcare entities in terms of responding and, and how they can serve their patients during COVID-19. Um, and then really using technology to do that and how connected care and remote care can really help to facilitate uh, care that's so important and valuable uh, in today's uh, current state. Um, and then how sort of the landscape of healthcare delivery is changing given everything that's been going on. I'll make sure to save some time uh, at the end for any questions. Um, as a reminder, all the materials here, the recording and the slides will be shared out afterwards. Um, please feel free to use the chat uh, functionality to submit questions that we'll have at the end. And we've also included some handouts as well, just for some helpful materials uh, on the topic uh, in the handout section of your GoToWebinar pane. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll let uh, today's hosts uh, introduce themselves. And Jeff, go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll get you started here. Hi, good afternoon. This is Jeff Bramscheiber. I'm a CPA and consultant in the healthcare practice of Wifley. We're a national CPA and consultant firm with offices across the country, about 50 offices, uh, about 2,400 associates, and we serve uh, the needs of many different types of healthcare provider organizations. Adam? Thanks, Jeff. I'm Adam Pardis, Chief Operating Officer, one of the co-founders of Neuroflow. Uh, my background is in uh, academic research and technology transfer. I'm excited to be chatting with you guys today. So just to jump right in, um, I'll go through some high level um, background information here, uh, but we certainly have a lot more that we can provide. So if there's specific things you want to learn about um, that we didn't touch on during the presentation, again, feel free to use the, the chat or reach out to us after. Um, and to give a little bit of background here, this is not a completely new program by the FCC. This has actually been in the works um, pre-COVID-19 as the Connected Care uh, pilot program, which was $100 million um, to support uh, awards to eligible uh, healthcare institutions and then practices uh, for using services for up to three years. So this um, COVID-19 telehealth program was allocated on top of that. So this is a new $200 million um, that's available right now. Um, so the application went live last Monday. First awards were announced this past Friday, and there were another handful of awards announced yesterday, now totaling about $7 million uh, and 11 awards. It's been, uh, let's say, primarily larger institutions that have received these so far, but um, no reason to believe that there's um, any, any preference there. As you'll see, some of the ones highlighted here are the community health centers, uh, federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, um, so this is eligible for uh, quite a number of different uh, types of uh, healthcare entities. Uh, and in terms of what it actually takes to submit for this and, and what can be submitted, it's a fairly light lift. Uh, so really much like the Paycheck Protection Program that Jeff will talk about in a few minutes, uh, really no reason to not um, apply for this uh, and to do so in a timely manner because the funds are only available until they dry out or the pandemic ends. And given the pace of how they've been awarded so far, we don't expect this to be available for uh, an extended period. So you'll see here the few online forms that need to get filled out. Um, all this can be done uh, pretty rapidly. We've had um, customers and partners of ours that have submitted this you know, within hours of uh, finding out about it. Uh, really the only um, piece of this that can take a little bit longer uh, is registering with uh, SAM or the system of award management to actually receive the funds through direct deposit, uh, which can take up to a couple weeks, but is not required uh, prior to uh, requesting the funds. So you can go ahead, submit your application, uh, and then you know, immediately upon doing that, we would recommend uh, signing up for, for SAM so that you're all set. And to talk a little bit about the types of tools that um, you can apply funding towards and some of the things to consider, um, this is not just for video telehealth visits. Um, so if you already have those, 
in place, great. You can look for um, complementary solutions. Uh, that can be actual physical uh, devices, uh, whether they're you know, wearables to measure uh, you know, blood pressure, um, things like that, as long as they're uh, what are considered connected devices, so that information flows uh, from the device um, to a healthcare provider, those are eligible. Um, some of the broadband services, IT services themselves, if you need that in order to enable more uh, connected virtual care, whether that's on the provider or the patient side, um, as well as a number of remote patient monitoring um, solutions, uh, patient reported outcome solutions, anything that basically helps um, providers care for uh, patients remotely uh, is, is generally eligible uh, for funding here. And some of the things that should be considered as you're looking at um, you know, what to apply this towards. Uh, HIPAA compliance and security, of course, is you know, always a, a really important um, thing to consider. Uh, you want to be using uh, devices and platforms that uh, protect patient privacy, have business associates agreements to sign, um, looking for solutions that help uh, generate reimbursement through fee-for-service codes is a great um, uh, option to, to utilize these funds for. Since the cost is covered by the FCC, it allows you to uh, you know, reduce that barrier to adoption and actually make it self-sustaining. Uh, and then thinking about how it integrates with your existing tools and workflows. So again, if you already have uh, a video telehealth solution, a, a synchronous solution in place, this is a fantastic way um, to add to uh, the type of virtual care that you can provide. So I'll hand it over to Jeff to talk about some of the other uh, opportunities for uh, funding for a lot of these health centers. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, it's no surprise that the uh, pandemic has been a huge business interruption for nearly every organization throughout the country. Uh, as a way of um, softening the blow, so to speak, and as an incentive to keep businesses employing individual employees, uh, the Small Business Administration has offered um, the most common uh, mech, uh, form of funding through the patient or the Paycheck Patient Protection Program, easy for me to say. Uh, the PPP program uh, has received a lot of press, uh, largely because it ran out of money. Uh, within the first week of being offered, the initial uh, $350 billion uh, was tapped out in a relatively short period of time. Um, Currently, there's a bill uh, that passed the Senate um, and is uh, being considered by the House to restore funding up to just over another $300 billion to replenish the funds and open the doors up again for the Paycheck Protection Program. So I just want to describe a little bit about uh, that program itself. Uh, it's any business, uh, small business, uh, less than 500 employees is eligible for uh, uh, applying for the loan. Uh, the, the maximum amount of the loan is calculated based on average monthly payroll costs, uh, and uh, the, the calculation uh, comes to about two and a half months average payroll costs uh, would be the maximum amount of the loan up to an overall maximum of $10 million. Uh, many of our clients have applied for, and, and quite a few have actually received the money in the first round. Uh, we suspect that a number of organizations will also apply in the second round, um, largely because the unique provision included with that program is a potential for loan forgiveness. The loan forgiveness component is available to organizations who uh, take out a loan and then continue to employ individuals for the eight-week period beginning with the first day after the loan proceeds are received by the entity. So. The, the clock starts ticking the day after the loan proceeds are received, and for an eight-week period, the cost of employing staff, um, as well as salaries, as well as benefits, um, and in addition to that, the cost of rent, uh, utilities, and interest on mortgages can be applied against the loan in the form of loan forgiveness. Um, that loan forgiveness is a separate process um, that organizations must apply for um, at the conclusion of that eight week period. Um, but it is anticipated that most organizations who obtain the PPP uh, will have some degree of loan forgiveness. Uh, in the event that the entire loan is not forgiven, which uh, is probably the case in most instances, the 
loan will convert to uh, the, the remaining proceeds of the loan will convert to a two-year note and interest is calculated at 1% uh, for the outstanding balance. Uh, important to identify that or recognize that that loan forgiveness is actually a non-taxable event, uh, which is fairly uncommon. Um, in most instances, loan forgiveness is considered income to the recipient and is taxable. So in this instance, uh, there are no taxes that apply to that loan forgiveness as well. Um, again, very popular program. Um, in addition to the PPP, the SBA also offered uh, the uh, Economic Injury and Disaster Loan Program, uh, the EDIL program also ran out of money and is slated to be refunded up to, I believe, about $60 billion. So there may be some additional funds available through SBA. In addition to the SBA, uh, there's also funds um, that became available through uh, the Department of Health and Human Services for healthcare providers uh, as part of the $100 billion stimulus money. Uh, a week ago, or a little over a week ago, on a Friday morning, April 10th, we were surprised by uh, many of our clients who received direct deposits into their accounts from an unknown source, essentially. Uh, they, uh, this money was part of the $30 billion release of funds to providers. Uh, that was based on a calculation uh, of roughly 6% of 2019 Medicare payments. So as a provider, if you received Medicare payments in 2019, um, the stimulus money was calculated at 6% of that total amount, and those funds were deposited in your account through direct deposit on Friday, April 10th. Um, there was not advance notice given, and it wasn't until that day that organizations realized that they had that money. There are some strings attached. Um, essentially, the, the organization must attest to a series of terms and conditions uh, within 30 days of the receipt of that money um, in order to be able to keep that uh, that money free and clear. Um, that att attestation is published on the DHHS website. Just recognize there are 10 pages of terms and conditions uh, that a provider must um, attest to in order to receive the money. And if no attestation is filed, it's assumed that the organization agrees to the terms and conditions in order to keep that, keep that money. Additionally, there's another $70 billion of undistributed money available through DHHS uh, that is pending uh, uh, distribution. Well, our understanding is that organizations that serve unusually high amounts of Medicaid beneficiaries or serve in rural markets or also serve high numbers of uninsured individuals uh, will be targeted in that next go round, but we're still waiting for details on that. In addition to some of the SBA and DHHS stimulus money uh, for federally, federally qualified health centers or community health centers, there are additional funds available and have been distributed in various ways. Uh, the initial $100 million of COVID-19 supplemental appropriations was, was distributed towards the end of March. That averaged about $70,000 per health center. In addition to that, in early April, $1.3 billion dollars through the CARES Act was distributed and that averaged approximately $950,000 per health center. And then finally, um, the Section 330 grant advance payments uh, program was implemented in early April as well, which is essentially is not new money, but it's an acceleration of those grant funds that would normally have been paid to the um, health center over the course of the year. So. Uh, some very specific funding mechanisms for the FQHC community as well. So let's say you're you're an FQHC or one of the other eligible um, entities for this FCC COVID-19 telehealth funding. Um, I want to give a little bit of uh, insight into what Neuroflow offers, which I think will also provide a good example of the types of technologies um, that you may be looking to um, you know, subsidize the cost of through this program and to be able to get into the hands of your providers and patients um, quite quickly. Uh, so Neuroflow is a, a technology company and really our goal is to bridge the gap between behavioral and physical health. And, you know, obviously the end goal of that being helping people feel better and helping reduce the cost of care to the entire system. And at the core of, of how we do that and, you know, why it's relevant in our current, uh, our current dynamic uh, is that a lot of this can happen Frankly, all of it can happen remotely. So the first first step in this equation is you know, getting a, a pulse on uh, how our population is 
uh, trending both at a single point in time as well as over time. So practicing measurement-based care for behavioral health, um, using assessments to understand you know, what is the, the rate and prevalence of uh, depression in our population, uh, what about anxiety, especially, you know, given the social isolation, um, all the things going on right now, um, understanding how, uh, you know, patients are doing uh, when they're not coming in to see you is critical, and then understanding how to best manage those patients. So who do we prioritize getting those telehealth visits, those one-to-one -one visits as soon as possible, because right now we're, you know, totally overwhelmed by demand. Uh, we want to make sure we're prioritizing the, the highest acuity patients and then also practicing you know, evidence-based guidelines. Um, so part of what we do is uh, clinical decision support uh, to inform often you know, physical health providers um, that are managing uh, behavioral health on the front lines. And then lastly, closing that feedback loop and equipping uh, patients with uh, both mobile and web tools to actually help drive the behavior change. Um, because we know that just having uh, encounters uh, from time to time uh, is not going to lead to um, the behavior change alone that we need uh, for people to actually, uh, you know, feel better. So having these tools available to them 24-7, uh, where they can also complete assessments remotely, and that information is automatically getting pushed uh, back to the healthcare um, team so it informs their, their care. Uh, I just wanted to touch on, too, that, you know, we've introduced quite a number of tools um, that are you know, even more relevant right now uh, in the wake of COVID-19, whether those are tools for um, your actual your employees, your healthcare providers to help prevent against burnout, um, or it's for uh, patients who are in quarantine and struggling with isolation and anxiety, or potentially for caregivers of those patients. Um, so all of this is, is available in, in what we do and you know, it doesn't require someone coming in uh, for a face-to-face -face visit. So I'll pass it back to Jeff to talk about you know, what we expect to see uh, change in the short term and then in the long term as it relates to telehealth. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Adam. You know, the discussion on telehealth is, is um, often influenced by factors uh, directly related to funding as well as reimbursement. Uh, and, and the single largest buyer of healthcare services in the country is, a, is the Medicare program. Uh, Medicare program historically has not um, been very flexible in terms of their um, reimbursement for telehealth or virtual services. The uh, current pandemic has changed all that and nearly every facet of uh, telehealth or virtual services uh, has changed in some respects uh, uh, through the Medicare program. And as a result, many other payers have also changed their reimbursement and coverage determinations uh, to, to fall in line with uh, what Medicare has done. Um, historically, the Medicare program has provided uh, benefits uh, related to care management services, which are essentially uh, managing chronic conditions for patients through a virtual service offering, not truly telehealth, but really ways of staying in direct contact with patients and helping them manage their conditions um, on an ongoing basis. Um, the Medicare program has provided uh, reimbursement for virtual check-in type services, uh, as well as some limited telephone visits, and in some cases telehealth, but very restrictive in their telehealth reimbursement. That all changed uh, during the current um, pandemic, and Medicare program has expanded to a point where Medicare patients now can receive telehealth services from their home uh, providers in any location, even from their homes, can administer uh, those services and reimbursement and coverage uh, is remains in effect for um, all services that have historically been offered as well as uh, the new telehealth services in which the provider now can be the distant site provider uh, from nearly any location, as opposed to a very restrictive list of locations. So it's really opened the door for a significant change in the delivery of healthcare services uh, today during the current uh, public health emergency. The challenge for most providers though is looking ahead to say, how is this going to affect our businesses? How is it gonna affect our delivery model going forward? Most of the changes have been made 
uh, on a temporary basis. Um, we truly don't believe that those changes, though, will only be temporary. Uh, the, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, in terms of the, of the benefits and the convenience of care being delivered through telehealth or virtual means, and it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to put that back. Uh, so we believe that um, uh, the uh, healthcare organizations uh, will need to embrace how changes, how care will be delivered differently in the future uh, using uh, some of these new tools, uh, uh, along with telehealth and virtual services, really also shifting the, the location of services, perhaps, less hospitalizations and fewer office visits uh, uh, and, and more care being delivered in a patient home. Uh, we also believe that organizations will need to be even more aware of the current environment in which they serve their patients, uh, uh, segregating waiting rooms, for example, and um, limiting the amount of walk-ins so that uh, we don't have concentrations of patients in the physician office, for example. So the how, how care will be, uh, will be delivered, we think, will be different um, even after the, pan the pandemic, as will some of the, the type of care or what care will be uh, uh, delivered as well. Uh, currently, most elective uh, non-emergent type services are suspended. Uh, we don't believe that um, all of that care um, may be rendered in the future uh, in the same ways that it would have been done in the past. So really providers are, are challenged with uh, looking at the types of services they offer and really uh, taking the time now to fully evaluate um, how much of that care will be done in the future and how that will be how that would, might be changed uh, for their to meet their patient needs in the future. Yeah, before we go into the, the q and I think just to tie it back together, you know, this changing landscape and environment is all the more reason to, um, you know, try to act quickly with this, this FCC funding because it's an opportunity to um, reduce the, the barrier to entry, basically try before you buy and, you know, have the FCC um, pick up the initial tab and then demonstrate that, you know, it's, it's sustainable and, and works for your populations. Um, and ideally, you know, like we mentioned earlier, while we still operate in a primarily fee-for-service environment, you know, finding solutions that can help be self-sustaining and, you know, even um, provide new revenue streams, um, which is a lot of what we help our partners with. Uh, so, if, you know, if you're able to act quickly and it is fairly easy to submit these applications, um, you know, it's a, it's a really unique opportunity um, to do a lot of what I think we've heard from providers saying they want to do it just hasn't been high enough on their list or, you know, they don't have the, the funds for it. Um, you know, right now we're in a situation where we need to be doing virtual care. And now there's also an opportunity um, to subsidize the cost. Uh, a very unique position, but a, a fleeting and, and short time window. Thanks, uh, both Jeff and Adam. Really uh, great stuff here. A, a handful of questions um, that have come in so far. And one was about the disbursement of, of the funding and how this all kind of works. Um, Adam and Jeff, any kind of details on sort of, you know, the when and the how of, of these funds actually get uh, reimbursed and, and shared for the providers so they can start delivering care? Yeah, so the the when is, is pretty straightforward. As long as um, your application has been approved, um, you'll then be required to submit uh, invoices that will be reimbursed uh, through direct deposit, which is why you have to set up the, the SAM account. Um, but these are being evaluated on a rolling basis. Um, so it's pretty rapid, uh, both not only in terms of the, um, the application itself, but um, getting getting up and running and getting your payment. Um, also should note that uh, you're able to submit applications for recent purchases uh, dating back to early March uh, when the pandemic uh, really started to, to scale up. Um, so this is not just for new purchases uh, if you're wishing, oh, I wish this had come about, you know, a month earlier, um, you may actually still be eligible for that. Um, Jeff, you mentioned a little bit earlier, any other details that you know or can share about the $225 million that was just recently announced for, for rural care centers? Um, um, you mentioned those sort of still being uh, discussed in the Senate, but anything else, just a, a few of the attendees were asking about that. Um, yeah, so that information came out um, just this morning, and the um, as part of the, well, I guess it's version 3.5 of the stimulus money, um, because it's not completed, 
yet uh, is uh, $225 million allocated specifically for certified rural health clinics, both for-profit and non-profit rural health clinics. Um, the information I'm receiving is it's related to uh, the costs associated with testing and other related expenses to COVID-19. Um, if that's consistent with other programs, it's not simply treating individuals who happen to have the virus, but it also is for offsetting the cost of, of uh, changing your organization, your patient flow in order to offset the cost uh, related to uh, the, uh, the virus. So more details will be coming forward. Uh, at this point, it's still not final, uh, but there's a very good chance that we'll learn in the next day or so on this additional $225 million for rural health funds. Thank you. Um, and just as a reminder, some folks, there is a, some helpful handouts that we included in the uh, Go to Webinar that provide some details on eligibility and timing of all this. Um, Adam, some questions coming in around um, can private practices apply? Can small businesses apply? Sort of trying to understand kind of the eligibility of, of certain entities for the SEC program and others. Yeah, so hard to say um, broadly without knowing more. Um, about the the types of practices, um, but if they do fit, you know, the criteria, let's say for like a, a community health center, um, a rural health center, um, or in some cases, you know, we've seen a, a lot of um, requests for um, sites that treat a lot of uh, Medicaid patients or, uh, you know, folks without insurance, uh, veterans. Um, you know, disadvantaged communities. Uh, so if you're unsure about eligibility, the, uh, the recommendation from the FCC has been to, um, to still submit an application uh, and they will be performing um, a greater diligence process afterwards uh, to, to determine that final eligibility. Uh, but this is certainly not only for, you know, the large academic uh, medical centers and large nonprofit hospitals. Um, as long as you, you meet the requirements, uh, you know, you, you can still apply. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Well, as we're wrapping up here, just sort of any kind of quick final thoughts, Jeff or Adam, the, uh, for the attendees before we, we wrap up here? Um, from my perspective, I think in any of these programs, time is of essence. Uh, these funds will not be available uh, for long, uh, particularly uh, some of the loan programs we've seen uh, run out of money in a short period of time. So um, I encourage every organization uh, who's eligible to apply um, you can always pay the money back if you get it, or you can uh, return it at a later date. Uh, but if you don't apply, you won't even have that choice. So I would just encourage organizations to pursue funding opportunities to the extent that they're eligible. Yeah, I, I echo that. And I think it's, it's easy to say it's challenging to execute in this environment when we're all worrying about a lot of different things. And you know, healthcare providers have an even tougher job than usual on top of what is already a, a challenging uh, job, but if if you can find someone in your organization who can who can take this by the reins and and lead it, you know again it's not it's not a big lift, and the longer you wait, um, the the lower the likelihood of of getting these types of funds. So it is something that is worth um, trying to, to prioritize in short order. Great. Um, well, well, thank you both to Adam and Jeff, and uh, as you mentioned, everyone's very busy during these uh, these times, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up a, a minute or two early. Thank you for your time. And as a reminder, uh, the contact information for both Adam and Jeff is here on the screen, and uh, these materials and recording will be shared to all registrants uh, in a follow-up notice soon. So thank you for your time, and stay safe and healthy out there, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.